Hi there. I am going to talk about the Web Storage API. Web Storage API. Sounds pretty cool and sophisticated. Uh, fortunately, is a reasonably straightforward way of making our programs remember things uh, when they're not running. That's the plan. So the Web Storage API is a standard supported by pretty much all of the browsers um, that allows us to save and load data from our program onto the user's browser. That's really what it does. And the great thing about that is that if our program runs and then we save some data and then the user closes our program, they close the window that the program is in, um, but then later they come back and run the same program in the same browser, then we can load the data that we had from before and we can remember stuff uh, between visits, right? Uh, and that's super exciting because it would allow us to have programs that persist over time, that remember things. Um, most obviously, you know, something like a high score or maybe the website remembers your name from the previous time that you visited it. Uh, but also potentially more interesting things like uh, an AI web page that kind of develops a, re a relationship with you over time. Um, or uh, the ability for the user to enter complicated data into like, I don't know, a notebook or something or a diary that can be remembered between visits. So there's a lot of stuff that we can do if we can remember data between uh, runs of our program. And that is all supported with the web storage API, this thing that is built into uh, the browser. Uh, there's lots of documentation for that online and I'll uh, provide links to that. Uh, but it's sufficiently uh, simple uh, that I'll just talk through how it works uh, here with examples. And the key thing to know is really that we'll largely be talking about a variable, uh, which is called local storage, uh, that exists when you're programming for the browser and that gives us access uh, to this web storage API. Okay, So local storage is this thing that we're going to use uh, to get access to it. So how does this work? The way that I'm going to talk about this initially is I've got a little program here, a little empty program, uh, and I'm going to run uh, the server for it over here. I'm just realizing something. Nope, that's good. And rather than write the program in Atom, I'm just going to do some examples in the JavaScript console itself over here. Okay, So I'll make this a bit bigger, and I'll make it take up most of the screen. That's too big. That's ridiculous. OK, so I can type JavaScript in here, and it will be run as if it's running on my page. So how does this work? So we've got this thing called local storage, this thing here. And you can see there's all kinds of autocomplete stuff going in here, but let's just ignore all of that stuff for now. So the first thing that we need to know is how do we save some information uh, to the browser? And the way that we do that is we write local storage, which is this thing that gives us access to the web storage API, dot set item. You can see some examples of my having done that earlier on. We say set item, and then the first thing that we have to provide to set item is a key uh, that names the data so that when we load it again, we know what the data was called, right? So this is going to be a key. So for example, we could have something like meaning of life. So that's the key. It's a string, right? So I've got it in quote marks here, back text in my case. So that's the name of the place that I'm going to store the data so that I can remember it later on. And then the second thing that I need to give it is the data itself to save, the value that we're going to save under that name to the browser. So I'm going to say that that is be excellent to each other, just like Bill and Ted taught us. OK, so this line here, local storage dot set item, is going to save the phrase be excellent to each other into the user's browser in a place called meaning of life, right? Um, so I'm going to hit return to make that happen. And that's now saved because I executed that instruction. That's as if it was in my program and I had run the program. Um, so the key things to remember are you have to provide this key, this name of the data. That's always a string. The thing that you save is any kind of JavaScript value here, like you know numbers or strings or booleans, etc. We'll talk more about this because to save objects and arrays uh, using set item is a slightly more complicated thing, and we'll look at a good solution for that. So we've saved this data, right? We've saved this thing called meaning of life. What if I want to get it back? Um, to get it back, 
I want to load it, right? And the loading thing is called, as you might expect, get item. So if I want to load it, I'm going to need to load it and store it in a variable. So I'm going to have a variable called meaning. So let meaning is going to declare that variable. And I'm going to assign it local storage dot storage storage dot get item meaning of life. So that's how restoring stuff, loading stuff is, right? So same thing, local storage is the thing I use to access the web API. Get item is the thing that I use to load data from the browser. And I provide one piece of information, which is what is the name of the data? Like what did I call it when I saved it? We remember I called it meaning of life, right? So I'm gonna load whatever is stored at the place meaning of life into my variable called meaning. And then if I want to print out what's inside meaning, you can see there, it's be excellent to each other, right? So I loaded the data that I had saved. And the most important thing here is if I reload this whole page, which we know reruns the entire program. So now we've started the program again. Traditionally, our programs at this point have forgotten everything, right? Like there's nothing, uh, there's no holdover or memory from the previous time that I ran it, but I can actually load it again meaning of life. So long as I remember the name of the place I stored the data, I can run that same instruction that I ran before. Uh, sorry, local storage.get item, right? My bad. Um, I can say load the thing at this position, at this place, meaning of life. And if I print out what's inside meaning now, again, be excellent to each other. So it's saved independently of my program. That's the key thing that we get with this web storage API is that data is not part of the program, it's saved into the browser. And that allows us to remember things even when we reload the page uh, or quit the browser and come back in 10 days, etc. It's saved into the computer. Um, so that's the key really, set item to save something, get item to load it. One other key observation about this is that uh, if we try to get something that's not there, um, I'm gonna call this moaning, if I try and load something from local storage with get item, like moaning of life. Now I haven't saved anything uh, into a position called moaning of life, uh, even though that sort of sounds like an accurate way that life feels sometimes uh, that we moan about it. Uh, but there's nothing saved there. So what happens if I try and load it? Um, it's going to let me, it's not going to be an error, right? But if I print out what's inside moaning, the variable, it's null. So this tells us that if you try and load something that isn't there, there's no data associated with that key, then you're gonna get back this thing null. Uh, and that's good because it means that we know that there wasn't something there. That lets us check um, whether there is or is not some data stored under that key. So if it's null, it means there's no data there. And if it's not null, it means that there is data there. And it's important when we're loading data to be able to check if it's uh, actually there or not, right? We need to know whether there was something to load. One more observation about get item. Um, and to do this, I'm gonna save uh, some other stuff. So let me say local storage dot set item. Um, and I'm just gonna save a number here. My, my number. And I'm gonna save the number 50, right? So you can see here, I am saving the number 50. It's literally the number just written as you might expect. And I'm saving it to a place called my number. So if I hit return, that works. That has saved the number 50, uh, which is great. That's what we wanted. However, if I try and load that number with local storage dot get item and getting the thing at my number, which is where I just saved it, um, we run into something that we could say is a problem. Uh, so let's do that and let's print out what's inside number. What's inside number is a string with the number 50 in it, not the actual number 50. Okay, and that's a really important difference because we can't do the same things with a string that we can do with a number. I can't add one to 50, for example, right? If I say number plus equals 10, for example, I would want that to make 60, right? Because I think that number is, is 50 and I want to add 10 to it. But if I do that, the result is 50 and then 10 because it's a string. So every single time we load something with get item, it's giving it back to us as a string. 
if we didn't save it as a string, that kind of sucks because it's not the same data that we saved that we're getting back. And that is a problem um, that we want to be able to repair. And there are different ways to deal with this, all kinds of different ways that we can get around this. But I think that the most convenient way to actually deal with this is that we should always save our objects, um, our, sorry, our data as an object instead of uh, a number or a Boolean, etc. And this has, this has multiple advantages uh, because it actually allows us to save multiple values at the same time. So to do this, there is an extra step. As I said, saving uh, and loading uh, arrays and objects in particular has a slightly a slight extra step, which is that we already know that this web storage thing saves things as strings, right? Like under the hood somewhere, everything gets converted to a string and it gets loaded as a string. So that means that we're going to need to, if we want to save uh, an object, which is difficult uh, or complicated to save as a string, we're going to need to convert an object to a string before we save it. And we're going to need to convert it from a string when we load it. And fortunately, there are already two functions uh, that do this, and we're going to use those. So the first one is called json.stringify. So let's create an object. Um, I'm just going to call it data. Um, I'm going to do it this way. So an object called data, which is going to have a string in it, be excellent, not even to each other, just be excellent. And it's going to have a, uh, a number in it, 50. And it's going to have an array in it, which is going to be one, two, three. Okay, so it's got these three things inside of it. So I can print out data now and you can see that data has a string, a number, and an array inside of it. If I want to save the data, I need to convert it to a string first. So I'm going to convert the data to a string by using this thing json.stringify. So this is the extra step. json.stringify takes one argument, which is the, the object that you want to convert into a string, which is my data object. And it returns that thing, except it's converted into a string. So I'm going to do that. If I print out what's inside data string, you can see it's pretty similar, right? Like it is just the object, except that the whole thing is inside quote marks now. And various other small changes, right? Like we can see, for example, that all of the property names now are also in quote marks. And what this means is that we can save it, because now it's just a string. So I can save my data string uh, into local storage, local storage dot set item, uh, I'll call it example data, and I'm going to save the data string that I just made. Okay, so that saves, and it saves nicely because it's already a string, and we know that's what the, the storage thing is expecting. Uh, but it also means that I can now load this again, and it will be kind of what I expect because it's going to be a string. So let's load it into loaded data is assigned local storage dot get item example data. So the thing that I just saved was a string, and I know that when I load it, it's going to be a string as well. So I'm going to load it into this uh, variable name called loaded data string. So what's inside that? Uh, oops, sorry, loaded data string. I typed it in wrong. It's that same string that I saved, right? So that's good because we know that we converted our object into a string and saved it, and it's coming out the way that we expected. So that's a good thing. Then I need to be able to convert the string back into an object so that I can actually access all of that data the way that it's meant to be accessed. And to do that, there's another uh, function that's kind of the, the corollary to json.stringify, which is json.parse. So I can say let loaded data data <laughs> is json.parse loaded data string. Okay? So json.parse, json.parse, parse. Passing means to go through some data and convert it into uh, a more uh, amenable form, a, a more understandable form. So we give it the string version of our object that we loaded. That's this thing that we loaded up here. And it will convert it into a proper JavaScript object. And it will put that into my loaded data variable. So let's look at what's inside loaded data now. Loaded data, good grief. And you can see it is the correct stuff, right? It's got the string property, the number property, and the array, so that, for example, loaded data.number contains the number 50. 
And if I wanted to increase that by 10, dot number plus equals 10, now it's 60, right? It's not 50, 10, it's 60. So the beauty of this basic idea is that we should save the data in our programs as an object that we first convert to a string, and then we should bring it back out uh, as a string and convert it back to an object. And this will avoid all of the problems that we might have with our data being kind of converted to a string when we don't want it to be, okay? So that's the principle that we're operating on here. Let's look at an actual example of this so that we're not uh, dealing in quite so much abstraction. So let's make a very simple, uh, we'll call it a game, it's barely a game. We're gonna make a game that counts how many times you click on the, the, the window. Pretty basic, I know. So let's make some, some basic stuff here, window width, window height, and every time you click, so I'm gonna need a mouse pressed uh, function here, that clicks variable is gonna go up by one, right? So every time I click, this variable goes up from zero uh, up to whatever. Uh, I'm also going to set the background to white, and then I'm just gonna display the number of clicks. So I'm gonna push and pop, I'm gonna set the text size to something reasonably large, I'm gonna align it to the center, 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 uh, in fact, and I'm going to give it a text style of bold so it looks all cool. And I'm going to fill with black. And then I'm going to display the clicks variable in the center of the canvas. So all this program does now is it counts how many times you've clicked and it displays that. Let's go over and look at it. Zero to begin with. And if I click, click, it goes up to one, click, 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 etc. So you, you can imagine me getting obsessed with like, oh, I've got to win this game by uh, clicking uh, and it will kind of go on forever or at least until JavaScript uh, is no longer able to represent a large enough number, which I think would take an extremely long time. I'm not going to test it, 100. So that's our game. Now this we could imagine would be hugely improved uh, if we could have a high score. So what we might want to be able to do is have a high score that's displayed to the user so that they've got kind of a target that they can uh, try and beat. It adds motivation, right? Now, the thing about this is that we have these kind of three main steps that we would need to follow if, we, if we're gonna have a, have a high score. Uh, we need to know what the high score is, right? Uh, and the way that we would know what the high score is is that we would load it uh, when the program starts. So we would need to check uh, for the high score by loading it. Then once we've loaded it, we need to check, is there actually saved information there or not, right? So remember that when we try and load something, uh, if it's not there, we'll get back null. So if we get back null, we would know that there is no high score. So that's good. We would then know that no high score has been set yet. Uh, if we do get something back, then we know that we saved the high score and that's the high score that we should use in the program. Uh, and then finally, of course, if the user beats the high score uh, with their clicking, then we would want to save that new high score because it's changed, okay? So let's incorporate that into our program. The first thing that we're gonna to want to do is we need to represent the high score, right? So it, it's tempting to just make a thing that's just like the high score when the program starts is zero, right? Just use a number. But remember that we said that it's probably a good idea to represent stuff uh, that we're gonna save uh, inside an object just because it makes our life easier. So instead of that, I'm gonna have an object called game data and that's going to be an object and inside it is gonna be a property called high score that starts out by default at zero. Same basic idea, but this is easier to save uh, and load and make sure that I maintain the format of things the way that I want to maintain them, right? It's also nice because if I wanted some other data in here later on like player name or they have set a preference for a color or all kinds of other possibilities, I could add that to the game data and save and load it in the same way. For now though, just a high score. Now, currently the high score is zero. So let's handle the idea that when they're clicking, they might set a high score. So when they click the mouse, the click goes up, we should check if it is just beaten the high score. So if clicks, which is their current score, is greater than the high score, which is in game data.highscore. 
if clicks is greater than that number, um, which we know in the default case it will be, right, because the high score just starts out as zero, then we want to set a new high score. So game data dot high score is no longer uh, what it was. It's now whatever clicks is, right? So we update it so that the current amount of clicks, uh, which is greater than the high score, is the high score. So that's good. So that updates the high score. But because they've set a new high score, we also should save that high score so that we remember it. So to save it, we use that set item idea, local storage dot set item. Um, I'm going to call it click attack game data. It's a good idea to make these names here pretty specific um, for a reason that we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, but it's a, just for now, just always think it's a good idea if that name is something specific, not just high score or game data, but something that really gets specifically to what this data is associated with. Now remember that I can't just say game data here, right? I can't just save the game data as is like this. I need to convert it to a string first with json.stringify. Now I could do that in a step uh, beforehand, but it's much, much more common actually to just stringify it here in place by saying json.stringify around the game data, right? So here is the bit that converts the game data into a string, and then that string that is the result of this is saved in local storage as click attack game data. That's just, a, it saves one step. Um, you'll just see this so commonly that I think it's, it's probably easier just to use this approach, okay? So if they set a high score, we update the game data and then we save the game data to this location. So that's the first thing that we need to be able to do. The other thing that we need to be able to do is we need to be able to load that data and use it if it's present. So we should do that in setup because that's when our program begins, right? So the first thing we want to do is we want to try and load that data. So let's make a thing called data and let's say local storage dot get item and we want to use that same key, right? Click attack game data. Load that. But again, we need to remember that we first, after we've done this, this needs to be converted from a string back to an object uh, so that if there is something there, it's in the right format. And again, we could do this in two steps, but it's probably easy, just as easy and much more common to use JSON praise, json.parse around this whole thing. So what is JSON parse going to take? It's whatever gets loaded, json.parse is going to convert that back into an object, and that object is going to end up in data. So it's doing those two steps in one step. That loads the data, but at the moment in the program, we don't know if that data uh, actually has anything there. If we've never saved the high score before, uh, the game data before, uh, then this will be null, right? Because there won't be anything there. So we have to check for that. If data uh, isn't null, right? If it's not null, then we know that there is some game data there. That means that there is a high score in there, and that means that we should use that high score. So if there is um, something in there, then the easiest thing that we can do is just actually replace our current game data, which is in the game data variable, with the data that we just loaded, right? So the current game data, which is what will actually be used in our program, is replaced with the data that we loaded. That's okay because we know that the data isn't null. So we know that it's the correct data that we were trying to load. If the data is null, i.e. if this if statement is false, then we don't do anything, right? Because we just want to use the default game data that has a high score of zero. So we don't need to worry about it in that case. Okay, so that is a key step, right? Load the data when the program starts, check if there's anything there, and if there is, then let's use the data that we loaded instead of the default data that we had. The final step is just to display that data, because now we have a high score. So let's do that uh, in draw so that it appears on the screen. So same basic idea, we need some styling commands. I'm gonna align this to the left and top because it's easy to position. I'm going to also style it, text style. I'm gonna use bold again. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna set it to a different color. No, I'll just make it black again, that seems fine. Um, and so now we can display the high score, right? Um, and we can do that by using the text. 
uh, we could just say game data dot high score. This will either be the default high score, which is zero, uh, if we didn't load any data, or it will be the high score that we loaded, right? Um, just for a little bit of a nicer presentation, I'm going to use a template string and say high score is whatever is inside game data dot high score. Um, no exclamation mark. I was tempted, but I'm not going to. And if I put that at 100, 100, then I'll have it sort of slightly indented from the top uh, and the left of the screen, right? So let's go and look at that and make sure it works, and then we can do one kind of uh, final recap. So there you go. So I've got the click. If I click, the high score is zero, right? So if I click, the high score is going to go up to one, and it's going to keep going up. It's up to 10, right? I set a, a high score. I feel very good about myself. Every time I set a high score, we know that it's using set item to save that high score data uh, into the browser. And what that means is that if I reload this page, reload, clicks goes back to zero, right? Because it gets set to zero at the top of the program, but it also went and loaded the game data, found that there was data, and therefore used it, which means that the high score is still 10, which means I can keep clicking here and the high score is not going up because I haven't beaten it yet. But when I get to 11, now the high score is going up again, and I can set an even more impressive high score, like 34. If I reload, my score goes back to zero because I'm starting again, but the high score data has been loaded at 34. And that really is the fundamental kind of structure that we need to remember when we're using this kind of data, right? We're going to have somewhere to store the data while the program is running. That will often have default values inside of it that we're okay with having if there is no data uh, previously saved. When our program runs, we should try and load the data, and then if there is data there, we should use it. So that's this part here, right, where we are using get item to get the data. We check to make sure if it's null or not, and if it's not null, we use the data in our program. And then when it's relevant, we need to make sure that we save the data. So if, in this instance, a high score gets set, we need to save that fact so that we remember it uh, for next time. And that's, that's the basic structure of using this web storage API, right? So that's most of what you need to know. But there's a, there's a couple more things that are worth knowing. Uh, one of these things is just like, where is the data, right? I'm looking at this like, where is the data uh, that's being saved? Where is it being saved to? Um, so the answer to that is very specific. Um, it's being saved into the browser, right? So I'm running Chrome. So this data is being saved in Chrome. That means that if I ran this exact same program in the same location, in Firefox, this data would not be there. There's no high score uh, in Firefox. I can show you that, in fact. I'll load Firefox right now. So let's go to Firefox. Took a while. Paste in the same address. And if I go here, let me wait for it to load. This Firefox is like doing a whole lot of stuff. You can see the high score is zero, right? Because I'm in a different browser. So the high score is saved per browser. So the data is being saved in Chrome in this case. The other big thing to know is that the data is being saved associated with the domain name that's being used. So because I'm running this uh, locally on my computer, it's 127.001. Uh, if I loaded this uh, on my website, on GitHub pages, it would be pippinbar.github.io. That would be the domain that's being used. Um, but it's really important to see that it's associated with the domain. So if I run the same program on two different domains, like I've got this local one here, but then I put it up on GitHub, um, that's going to have different uh, data as well, right? It's not going to be the same between them because they run on different domains, okay? So that's important to know as well. Um, it's also the case, and this is important when we're thinking about this domain thing, if you've got multiple programs running on the same domain, they're all sharing the same storage area in the browser. So that's why it's really important uh, to use these more specific keys, right? So click attack game data helps associate this data specifically with this program, not with any other program that might be running on the same domain. That's why that's important, because otherwise you could have collisions, right? If I had just called this game data or high score, but then I wrote another program that also saved something called game data or high score, they would be competing with one another and overwriting each other's data, which is not a good thing. So that's why we want to be specific about our naming. 
So that's the answer to where it is, right? It's in the browser, so it's in Chrome in this case, and it's associated with the domain that the program is running on. In this case, 127.0.0.1, which is the local server, um, but if you've got it up on the internet, then it's whatever domain name uh, it's being hosted at on the internet. So that's the story of where the data is. There is one last thing that we might obviously want to know, which is how do we delete stuff that's there? Um, one thing that you could do, of course, is you could set, you could use set item to set it to um, like null or something that means that it's not there, right? You could do that to kind of erase the data if you wanted to. Um, but there is a, there is a specific uh, function that we can use to actually delete data. So let's imagine, for example, that we want to be able to delete the, the game data in our, in our game here. So I'm going to do that with a key pressed function. And I'm going to use it uh, if they press the C key, just so that we've got an example. So if the key is the C key, then I want to delete uh, the data. I C for clear, right? So to do this, we say local storage, same thing. We're always talking to local storage to make this happen. And the third function that we can learn is remove item. And again, just like get item, we just provide it with the key of data that we want to remove. So if we press C, it will call remove item and that will just delete the data entirely. So let's go and look at that working. So over here, I've got my clicking game. Uh, the high score is 34, right? If I press C, we don't see anything happen, right? Because it just deleted the data that was saved. Um, but if I reload the page now, high score is back to zero, right? Because now there's no data associated with this page. And that's because I pressed C and when I pressed C, it called local storage .remove item, and that deleted the data that I named, okay? That's all that we really need to know about deletion. Uh, this is by far the safest way to delete data is to delete specifically the data for the thing that you are using. That's again why it's a good idea to have a nice specific name um, because then we're not accidentally gonna delete data for some other program. Just so you know, there is also a sort of nuclear option, which is that you can say local storage .clear. That will delete all of the data associated with this browser and this domain. Um, clearly, that's not a very good idea because you might end up deleting data for other programs. So you should really not use this unless you really, really, really want to, okay? So clear is the nuclear option that you shouldn't use. Remove item with a specific key is the good option that you should use, okay? That's it, that's all of the functions that we need to know. So we need to know that we can save data with set item and a key name. We can load data with get item and the same key name. And we know that if it's an object, which we should do, then we can convert it to and from strings uh, with stringify and parse. And that's really the totality of it. Oh, and of, and of course we can delete data with remove item. Um, there's just a couple, there's one last thing that I wanna talk about just so that you know that this is true, uh, as well as local storage, which is what we've been using, there is actually one called session storage as well. Uh, it works in exactly the same way, so you could replace all of the places that you write local storage with session storage, and it would still work. It has all of the same methods. The difference is that local storage um, saves the data kind of forever. So if the user closes the window, quits their browser, um, and comes back in a year and starts the browser again, that data will still be saved uh, in their browser and you will still be able to load it. So it's kind of permanent. It can be deleted, of course, by, um, by the user, but it's much, more, much less likely to go missing. Session storage only stores data while the program is running. So if the user closes the window, then the session storage is automatically cleared, okay? That's the difference. Um, so session storage is quite a lot more specific you could use it if you're wanting to kind of be kind to the user and not clutter up their browser with your data if you don't need it between um, times that your program runs. Uh, local storage is kind of the, the more fun uh, option. So generally speaking, I think local storage is, is probably the, the better option for most kinds of creative tasks. Um, okay, let's do, let's do one more example uh, and then we'll wrap this up. So here we go. Let's write a program that just remembers the user's name. I mean, it's a classic thing that we might want to do, right? So we're gonna use strict, user strict. 
And we're gonna obviously we're gonna have a setup and we're gonna have a draw because this is P5. Now, if we're gonna remember the user's name, we're gonna need somewhere to store this data while our program runs. This is always the first thing that we can think about. So I'm gonna have a user data object. And in it, I'm just gonna have one thing, which is their name. And the default, if I don't know their name, is that they're gonna be called stranger. That makes sense. Now, same, this is the same, the same basic ideas here as the, um, as the, the high score, right? It's the same kind of structure that we're gonna use. So let's create a canvas, window width, window height. And now when the program starts, we're gonna to want to check if we already know their name, right? So same thing, let's try and load that data. So we are gonna parse the results of local storage dot get item. And we're gonna say uh, web storage example personalization. I mean, that's nice and specific, right? <laughs> uh, so that's what I'm gonna load. I'm gonna try and load the thing saved at web storage example personalization. Again, we know that we need to check if this data is null. So if data does not equal null, then we know that we do know their name and we can copy it across, right? We can say user data dot name is data dot name because we know that we save, we will have saved the user's name in a name property. So that's what we would do if there is data, uh, but if there isn't data, so we tried to load their name uh, and there wasn't one already there, then we should find out what their name is. Then, and let's just do this right away, right? So in this case, we're gonna have an else. The way that we can most easily do this is we can use this thing called prompt, which is built into the browser. And what prompt does is it allows us to ask the user to enter some information. So we provide it with a string. So like, what's your name, for instance? And it will pop up a little dialog box um, in the browser with a place for the user to type some text. They type the text in and then prompt will return what they typed. So I'm assuming that they're gonna type their name and I'm gonna set user data dot name with what they typed in. So user data dot name is assigned whatever they type in when this prompt box comes up, okay? That's gonna ask their name. However, if they tell us their name, we also want to save their name for next time. So we should also store it. So local storage dot set item to save it to the thing, web storage example personalization. And what am I gonna save? I'm gonna save the stringified version of that, stringify uh, user data. So, and then of course, because it pops up a dialog box, it switches me across to the application. So if there is data, we use the data. If there isn't data, we're gonna ask for the data and then save it. So that's those basic, those basic steps, right? Then the, the only thing that kind of remains is to display um, something on the screen to show that we know their name. So let's do a push, the text size, let's say 64 text align in the center, and then we can say howdy, comma, and then insert their name, right? User data dot name. This will be stranger if, um, if we didn't load any data because there was nothing there, because that's the default right up here. And if we did load some data, it'll be whatever they said their name was. Oh, no, sorry, this is completely incorrect. What this will be is either what they, it'll be what they typed in uh, because it will prompt them or if they're coming back, it'll just be the data that we saved. My bad. Let's, uh, let's go and look at this and make sure that it works before we uh, comment further and confuse ourselves. So that's there to dis display it. And then we need to pop on the other side, right? So we go look at our program. It tried to load the data, right, in setup, uh, but there wasn't any data because we've never used this program before. So it pops up this thing. This is what prompt does that says, what's your name and provides me with something to type. And I can say, Tony. And if I say Tony and click OK, oh, and occasionally this is happening to me when I'm testing these things. I think it's because I've saved multiple times and it's reloading. This might happen again. There we go. So howdy Tony, right? So the first time I came in, it, there was no data, so it asked my name. But if I reload the page now, reload, oh, reload, 
it's not saving. So that's not the behavior that I was expecting, right? I was expecting that it would not repeatedly ask my name. So let's go and have a quick look at this. You can probably try and think about what kind of problem uh, is going on here. I'm just, so you can tell, so just debugging this, it's horrible that this is happening in the middle of a, a lecture, but you know, debugging is, uh, is always the right thing to do. Um, we need to figure out where this problem is. One thing that we can see is that we're always getting this else, right? So that suggests that when we're loading this data, um, every single time it's coming back as null, right? Because data does not equal null is false, and therefore it is null. Um, and I can see now what the problem is, which is that my get item key and my set item key are not the same. So when I am trying to load it, I'm loading one thing, and when I'm trying to set it, I'm trying to set something else because I'm missing an A in personalization here. And it just says personalization. Personalization. Uh, you probably saw that and were screaming at your screen, and I apologize. Okay, so if we correct that uh, and go back and say Tony, finally, howdy Tony. Oh, now we're getting that reload thing again. So howdy Tony, and then if I reload, it just says howdy Tony because it loaded, loaded my name and it remembered my name. And this is true even if, for example, I close that window and I go to packages and I go Atom Live Server stop, and then I go Atom Live Server start, and it starts up again, and it doesn't do that. That may be because the local server is erasing uh, everything between runs because the, yeah, because the actual server itself is, is of course a new server. So that didn't make as much sense. What would make sense more is if I close it and then I reopen it, it remembers that I'm Tony, right? So it's associated with this specific URL that got reset when the server uh, reran. Sorry for the confusion there. So that's the basic structure again, right? Default data at the top. Try and load the data at the start of your program. Uh, if there's data there, use the data by copying it across into your user data. And if there isn't data there, try and collect the data that you need, if that's the way that your program works, such as asking for a name. And then I guess, you know, display the data in some way so that the user knows that you have it. Okay. So that's what the web storage uh, API does. We can save and load data uh, in the user's browser, and that lets us write programs that can remember things, which can be super interesting, right? Because memory, uh, at least in the human sense, has a lot of emotional and poetic kinds of resonances. Um, so you know, as we said at the top, right, you could have a program that remembers the user and develops a relationship with, over, with them over time, kind of sharing secrets with each other, et cetera. Uh, you could equally have a, a program that kind of forgets things, like you tell it things, but then you don't visit often enough and it starts forgetting your name, uh, for example, or forgets what you like. Uh, or you could have, you know, anything else that you could imagine that deals with th this idea that the program exists across time. There's a lot of possibilities there, all thanks to the Web Storage API. Bye for now.